James Burnham was an important political writer in the 20th century. Earlier in his life, he was a Trotskyist, but he later became a conservative. He died in 1987, and throughout his life, he wrote many books, many of which analyze how power operates in contemporary societies and how he thought it would evolve in the future. One of the most relevant books that he wrote in this vein was The Managerial Revolution in 1941, which argued that the United States, along with the rest of the world, was currently in the middle of a major social revolution. The basic thesis is that this change is just as radical as the change was from feudalism to capitalism, and it shall dictate how social relations shall be governed for the foreseeable future. The new ruling class will be, as the name suggests, the managers. First, it's important to explain what exactly does James Burnham define as a social revolution. He says that it is, put simply, rapid social change. All societies and all times experience some degree of social change. The social organization in, say, 800s France was not identical to that in 1100s France, but it was pretty similar. Well, the social change from 1400s to the 1600s was clearly much more rapid. Thus, he argues that the state of America in 1941 was relatively akin to that of Western Europe in the 1500s. It is also very important to point out that when he talks about his social revolution, he is not talking about one particular event in which the cause of one social group is advanced against the interests of another social group. He is talking about a broad change of how societies in general are governed, and about the social relations within those societies. Individual instances are important because it's only through many individual instances that ultimately result in overall change. But he goes at length to explain that the social revolution that changed society from feudal to capitalist was not the result of one particular victory by the capitalists. Rather, it was the result of conditions which gave the capitalists the advantage and slowly whittled away the power of the feudal lords. Similarly, Burnham believed that in 1941, the conditions were such that capitalism was on the way out and that it would be replaced by managerial society. To understand this, first we need to understand feudalism and capitalism. Defenders of capitalism will often claim that it is just simply a result of human nature, but Burnham argues that this could not possibly be true, because though human nature may have something to do with capitalism, capitalism is hardly how societies have always been governed. In fact, capitalism has really only been around for a short period of human history. Capitalism is based on the relationship between two main social classes, the capital owners and the wage workers. The wage workers are not tied down to any specific type of labor, and they are given the ability to sell their labor on the market in whichever way they are able to. And the capital owners are the ones who control the instruments of production, and hire these wage workers. To us today, this system seems totally natural, but for the vast majority of human civilization, this system was almost totally absent. From the agricultural revolution and until capitalism, the vast majority of the Earth's population worked as subsistence farmers. Most people would have never had any contact with money whatsoever, and their labor would have been done to feed themselves and their family, along with paying some in the form of taxes. The way that political authority operated was also very different. For most people, the only authority that they dealt with was the lord directly above them, and the system was based on personal relationships between a variety of different people. Under capitalism, the most advanced capitalist countries were all organized as nation-states with centralized political authority. Are there similarities between capitalism and feudalism? Certainly. But the overall point is quite clear. Neither one of the two have a monopoly on human nature, and there is no reason to suspect that there couldn't be other systems which are also congruent with human nature. But just because there could be other systems that would work does not mean that we should suspect that there will be other systems to replace capitalism anytime soon. The reason that James Burnham argued that capitalism cannot continue to persist is because the current conditions in 1941 would not permit it to continue to exist. Specifically, this is because he argued that capitalism could no longer cope with the major struggles that were going on in the world. There were two main reasons why Burnham argued this. The first was economic, and the second is social. The economic reason should be pretty obvious. The massive economic disaster 
that the entire world was going through throughout the 30s, and which was only beginning to wrap up when he wrote this book. He argued that mass unemployment was epidemic, and that no society could survive this indefinitely. So society must change somehow. The social angle is, however, even more interesting. He argued that the old bourgeois capitalist ideologies were simply no longer able to motivate men's hearts the ways that they once were able to. The evidence for this was World War II, where Germany was able to successfully conquer much of Europe in only a few years, while the French and other nations were easily defeated. Even more glaring evidence that Burnham cited was that Britain was having a very hard time recruiting the soldiers that they needed, despite the fact that the nation had been going through the same economic problems that the rest of the Western world had been experiencing. Even unemployment was not good enough motivation to get people to fight in bourgeois society. The idea that the world was going through major social change was not a totally out-there concept. Many people believed this. However, the issue that Burnham believed that people had was that they were stuck in a dichotomy between socialism and capitalism. Socialists believed that socialism was inevitable and that capitalism was clearly failing and would soon be replaced with socialism, and the reasons that they cited were often quite similar to those that Burnham cited. However, Burnham believed that socialism could not possibly be the new social system that would replace capitalism. To understand this, first we need to understand what exactly is socialism. Burnham says that the three identifying characteristics of socialist ideology are classlessness, freedom, and internationalism. He argued that these three values in the Soviet Union were on the decline, not the increase, and that there was no reason to suspect that any other socialist experiment would produce anything different. He doesn't say that the Soviet Union hasn't reached the communist utopia yet, so socialism is fake. He says that if you look at the beginning of the Soviet Union, and you look at where it was in 1941, on all three of those values, the Soviet Union has gotten worse, not better. He cites statistics from Leon Trotsky, which show that the class divide in the Soviet Union was even worse than that in the United States. And he says even though Trotsky could be seen as a hostile source, Trotsky was specifically trying to defend it against people who said that the Soviet Union was not really socialist. For political freedom, he argues that at the beginning of the Soviet Union, when things are most tumultuous and it would be most understandable for a crackdown on political freedom, was when the Soviet Union was the most open. And then, later on, when Stalin took power, things became the most authoritarian and all opposition parties were outlawed, and all political freedom was reduced to an absolute minimum. And as for internationalism, a similar thing happened. The Soviet Union was the most internationalist at the beginning, and by 1941 it was promoting extreme Russian nationalism. His argument is interesting here, because he is essentially saying that socialists are right when they say that the Soviet Union was not true socialism, but his point is that true socialism cannot possibly be achieved, and that any attempt at achieving it will just result in all the bad things that occurred in the Soviet Union. So, as I was saying before, socialists agreed with Burnham's points on capitalism and said that capitalism was clearly on the way out, and they said that socialism would replace it. Similarly, capitalists agreed with Burnham on the problems of socialism and that real socialism cannot be achieved, and they argued that this proved that capitalism must be the system that will continue into the future, since socialism clearly cannot be that system. Burnham said that the problem with this whole conversation is that it's assuming that it either has to be socialism or capitalism. It can't be something else. He believed that the problem that was happening is that society was transitioning to managerial society, and that no one was really able to understand what was going on, because they were all either arguing about capitalism, a dead system, or socialism, a system that would never really be achieved. Burnham argued that the Soviet Union was the way of the future. It just wasn't the socialism that it claimed to be. The future that the Soviet Union represented was managerialism. However, as I already said earlier, a social revolution is not about the specific events of one particular country. He wasn't saying that the Soviet Union itself was the future, He was just saying that the social system that existed there was managerialism, and that the Soviet Union was the most advanced form of that social system. But what even is managerialism to begin with? I've gone ten minutes now, and I haven't even explained that, which seems like kind of an important part of all this. 
first we must see what is it that Burnham defines as a ruling class. The definition that he gives is a ruling class is whoever controls the instruments of production of a society, who receive preferential treatment in the distribution of goods, and get to decide what is done with those instruments of production. He argued that an additional issue with socialism is that socialists assumed all you have to do is abolish private property, and then basically you're good for achieving socialism, or at least being on your road to getting there. The issue with this, he argued, is that a class of people can control the instruments of production just as much as individuals can. It is true, of course, that under capitalism, individuals have individual control of individual factories or other instruments of production. But there's no reason at all to suspect that a class of people cannot be the ones that control it without any individual having the ownership invested in them. We have seen this before, where some sort of priestly ruling class, by virtue of being a member of that priestly ruling class, has special access that they don't individually possess, that they only possess as a member of the class. He argued that this new ruling class will be the government managers, the people that staff the government bureaucracies and the government itself, and they will control the economy and the instruments of production. But it isn't only the existing civil service that he said would be the new ruling class. He also identified that within existing companies, there was an increased alienation of the control that the legal owners had over their own companies. The people that supposedly owned their companies had less and less control, while there was instead a manager class who were doing the actual day-to-day -day operations. This private manager class would eventually be merged with the government manager class, and together they would manage the entire economy of the society that they preside over. This would eventually result in something like the Soviet Union, where government managers and the government itself controls the entirety of the economy. The old capitalist class would eventually be shuffled out of the way, and they would either have to incorporate themselves into the new managerial class, or they would ultimately lose all their power. In addition to the Soviet Union, he also thought that Germany in 1941 was a bit less advanced of an example of this type of society. He further predicted that the transition to managerial society would probably be completed in about 50 years. So that's the basic argument of the book. It's very interesting, but I have to say the overall thesis I don't really find incredibly compelling. If all he was saying is that modern capitalism is not really the same as historic capitalism, and there is now a managerial ruling class, then yes, that seems to be a pretty accurate way of summarizing modern society. But as I've already discussed, that's not what he's just saying. He very specifically was arguing that the managerial society of the future would look like the Soviet Union in some sense, and that the government would have total control over the economy. Now, I'm sure there are some libertarians who would argue that this is basically where we are now, but I don't think that's really the most accurate way of summarizing our current economic condition. But even if that is admitted, that the government is not directly controlling the entire economy, I don't think the government is even really indirectly controlling the entire economy. Because one could say that Burnham's hypothesis was correct, if ultimately the managerial class was the new ruling elite, but there was just a more complicated way of how exactly that shapes up. It is certainly true that the ruling class is not really composed in the same way that it would have been maybe 150 years ago, but the model of the managerial society I think is overly simplistic and isn't really the most accurate way of describing how things are run currently. So to summarize, it is an interesting book, and Burnham has an interesting analysis of a lot of trends that were going on at the time, and there are certain things that do seem quite clairvoyant today. However, overall, his prediction of the future was not entirely accurate. Thanks for watching. Please donate to my subscribe star if you enjoy this content. And please remember to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, and share these videos with anyone who you think might find them interesting. And a special thanks to my donors, Emmett Vestry, The Right Cafe, yourself, Cepheus Rex, Richard, Lita, Seth Apex, King of Evil Florida and the Moon, Josiah, Adzutko, Haxorius, Quo Pregranator, and Charismatic Byzantine. And thank you everyone very much for watching. Goodbye.